My dear friends, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Father Philip Tau, and this morning I will be discussing with you on the whole idea of loss and grief. I, I don't know anyone in this planet who has never experienced some form of loss and the resultant um, consequence of grief, grief which is our sense of sorrow over what we have lost, our sense of pain and maybe regret or guilt. It, it, it triggers several key emotions in us because we are in a sense revolting or re rejecting or refusing the fact that, refusing to accept that we have lost this thing or this person forever. So grief is a difficult uh, practice, it's a difficult issue for, for everyone because there is no manual, you know, where we go and, and read how to understand ourselves and grief as is appropriate with our sense of self, our personality types and so you, you never know and the way I grieve one person doesn't inform how I'm going to grieve someone else or something else. So that is why grief can be very, very daunting and frustrating. It, it takes everything out of us because it's a, it's a game of constant adaptation and adjustment. But it's important, especially in the context uh, that we find ourselves today with this virus ravaging every corner of our homes and our families and our businesses and our friendships and our churches it's time for us to also think about what we will lose and how we will live in spite and after those losses you know um, it is interesting how grief is not just a human thing i think it's also it's a thing that is identified with every living thing every living person because even god grieved i was just reading a while ago in the book of genesis chapter 6 verse 6 where god grieved that he had created man after just preceding the destruction of the earth god grieved now, why would God grieve? He grieved because he had lost the nature of relationship he wanted to have with man. And that caused him a lot of grief. And God decided on how he was going to deal with his grief. He dealt with his grief. He had to. And that means we too must deal with our grief. It cannot be avoided. It cannot be passed over to someone else, unfortunately. No one can take it from us. It's something we have to, to live with and to deal with. And so this morning, I want us to um, take some time and talk about, talk through all of this. You know, I'm sure if you look at the numbers on our television screens, those are very disturbing numbers. And to imagine that we are not even anywhere near what um, scientists and experts are thinking we would lose in our country alone. That scares the hell out of anyone, including me. Because behind those numbers are people's parents who would never be there to attend their weddings, to attend their graduations, to attend family events anymore. Those are all losses. In those numbers is someone's husband who would never be there again on that dinner table. In those numbers are people's children whose parents would never have grandchildren or never have the chance to have a daughter or a son-in-law. Those are numbers, but every number is a human being 
with very significant relationships that are going to be lost. That will cause a lot of grief. There's going to be a lot of grief in the land. It's even very sad that some families are going to lose more than one person. How do you deal with that? One death is one too many. There are families like the family in New Jersey that lost three, and I think others are still struggling for their own lives. And our hearts go out to all of those families. But that's our faith. Sadly, we cannot run away from it right now. We have to learn and practice how to comport ourselves in the face of this monster that is going to that is going to cause a lot of pain, human pain, in our society. Your grief, my grief, and the grief of everyone is concerning to God. And I have no doubt that God is going to be with us. God is going to help us by grace and by his love and by his presence to grieve everyone we have lost or will lose. Those who have taken time better than me to study the whole concept of loss and grief have talked about stages of grief. And in, in a sense, they have boxed grief as though it must follow all of those stages. Now, I personally disagree because grief from one person to the other could come in many forms. However, we, would, we will, in the course of our grief, go through all of those stages. Absolutely, yes, we will. They are part of our human response to loss. And in the course of our lives, you know, we've lost a lot of things already. We've lost friendships. We've lost homes. We've lost jobs. We've lost our tooth. We've lost our head, color. Listen, we lose a lot in the course of our lives. I was just thinking about it yesterday, trying to itemize all the things I have lost in the course of my life. People who were significant in my life, who made me who I am. However, it is different when you lose a person. If you lose a car, you could buy another car, maybe a better one. If you lose a home, God willing, you might have a better, a better home someday. If you lose a job, you could get a better job. Everything we lose is replaceable. The only thing that we lose and cannot replace is a person. Because each person is so uniquely, uniquely important and valuable to us. They are irreplaceable. Yes, you may lose a husband and get another husband. That doesn't mean you replaced the former. The affection, the love, and the significance of this person in your life can never be replaced. That's why losing a person is so hard. Because that hole remains there forever. You might learn to live with it. You just don't get through it. It's so hard. And that, 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 that even grieves me more, thinking about the fact that we are going to lose people in very strange circumstances. We're going to lose people we care about, we love, without being able to be by that side when they die. That complicates another aspect of our grief at this time, which is different than anything else we have ever experienced. So, let us brace ourselves. Let us prepare ourselves with God's grace to help us. Let us prepare to face this moment with great grace and with great spirits and with support from one another. I'd like to go through um, with the five stages that experts have said um, are the stages through which we grieve. The first experts say that denial, now denial itself is a means or is a strategy for us to survive a loss. And it is useful. It, it, it helps us to pace our loss 
and pace our time in such a way that we are able to almost like cut our losses or our grief in pits and pieces just so we're able to manage it. Denial makes grief manageable. So it's not crazy when you first of all approach your loss with a sense of denial as if, no, this, is, this, cannot, this cannot be. This is impossible. There is grace in denial. It's nature's way of letting in only as much as you can handle. So if denial is what you're feeling or what you feel, yeah, embrace it. It's part of your response to what you have lost. Because what you have lost is really significant to you. You're saying to yourself, no, it's not possible. But that, no, it's not possible, also allows you time to regain yourself. And just so you are able to handle what life is put in front of you. So you're not crazy. I'm not crazy when I experience denial in the face of so blatant a loss. It's just nature's way of preserving me, of helping me cope with what has just happened to me. Anger is some other emotion that is, is identified with loss and grief. We get really pissed. We get really, really mad. And anger must have an object. It doesn't just happen. And so we might get angry with the government for failure or whatever perceived um, disappointment we feel. We might even get this angry with God. We might get angry with this disease, angry with China, angry with, name it. We might just get angry with a doctor that didn't allow you to be there with your loved one, with policies that left us at home, unable to be where we would like to be at a time like this. So there's going to be anger on every side. And that's okay. What you are saying, you are admitting to yourself and to everyone that what you have lost matters to you. And you're angry and you're mad because you know that the person you have lost will never come back, at least not in this life. And so anger is well okay. It's normal. It's a normal reaction. Because whatever it is that you have lost that is causing you that anger meant something so valuable to you. Something so irreplaceable to you. And you're grieving that important person in your life. You remember in John's Gospel, the 11th chapter, you remember where Mary and Martha had sent for Jesus about Lazarus who was sick. And Jesus delayed coming. You remember when he finally arrived. When Martha met Jesus, he said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now, that wasn't some welcoming tone. She was mad. She was angry. Mary would not even get up to visit with the Lord or to welcome him. She was mad. They were angry that Jesus had not responded to their plea to come and visit and maybe heal Lazarus before he died. So, Anger is a natural response that I am rejecting this verdict. I am refusing this verdict, even though I may be limited to make any changes. This is not what I would choose if I had the chance to choose. That's why I'm angry. It's a recognition of my own limitation, my own helplessness and powerlessness in the face of a loss I can do nothing about. And so I blame everyone I thought in my mind could have done something. Now, there are times I could even blame myself because, or be angry at myself because I think maybe I had, could have done one thing differently or something else in some different way. So that's okay. If you're angry, just be aware why you are angry. Don't focus on the anger. Focus on why you are angry. You're angry because something Serious, something valuable has been taken away from you against your will. You feel violated by death or by whatever took this person away from you. That's your response to that sense of loss. So you are aware that something was important to you. So it's a good thing when anger is what you feel. 
Now, we may also begin at some point, we could begin before and after the loss. Before, beginning before our loss would be, God, if only you would maybe heal my daughter, doctors, if you only do this, you might plead to whatever other force you know out there. If only they would do this, what you will do. If God will just give my sister or my mother one more chance, I would reconcile with them. I would do everything. Yeah, you try to play all of that. That's our own way also of struggling, trying to get control of what is happening to us. Because we are aware we're losing control here. So we begin to bargain. Bargaining is admitting that the power is not with me, but I am reaching out to whoever has authority and power in this situation to let us do some transaction. If only you would give me this. Man, this is what I'm going to do. I will change this. I will change this. I will change that. Sometimes we might even be bargain with our loved one who is about to die. If you can just fight for me, if you can just fight for me and hang in there for me, I will do this. Now, that's, that's not because I'm crazy when I'm doing that. It is because I just feel so helpless, so powerless about what is about to happen to me. And beginning after, sometimes could be, God, I, I wish I would just come back, you know, and get a call that my sister, you know, just woke up because things like this have happened before. Or that what the, the information I got was wrong, that something else may have happened. So we, be, we do all of that. But that doesn't change. In most cases, it doesn't change the outcome. But it helps us survive the outcome in bits and pieces. It just allows us to catch enough at the time to deal with. So if you find yourself beginning, you're not running, you're not, you're not crazy. You're not mad. You're not getting mad. Even though grief feels like that, you are just struggling to cope with what has just happened to you. And finally, we would begin to reconcile. And to embrace the fact that our lives have changed in some way. That we are not the same person we were before. If I was a dad, I'm no longer a dad. At least in the sense of having a son or a daughter. If I was a mom, my title changes. Or if I was a spouse, your title changes immediately. Because something has happened. We begin to accept the fact that this person will no longer come back. As they were with us, we would only have to live with memories and images and experiences we had with them. That's all and pictures and, and everything else of value that they left for us. We begin to grow into acceptance. Now, acceptance should not be confused with everything it's okay. Everything will never be the same again. Everything will never be okay in that sense of okay but we learn to live with our new reality and it's possible we can because we are not the first others have lived through it you know uh, human be humanity has lived the course of its entire existence with losses of all kinds but people have learned to live through to thrive through not in spite of but to thrive through all of those losses because they are part of our being human. And so I hope that, you know, whatever stage of grief you are right now or will be in the future, that you would find grace and strength to deal with it. We have uh, various types of grief too. The experts have come up with any number. Some have 15, 20 different types of grief but there is not enough time to go through all of that here however i'll just um, speak about a few of those types of grief that we would feel in, in the course of our losses anticipatory grief that is grief before we lose somebody or we lose something i'll give you an example it, it normally happens when I hear that my loved one is sick, really, really sick. 
I begin to grieve the fact that they are going to pass. And I begin to grieve the fact that all of the things that we once did together will no longer happen. So I am grieving in anticipation. And sometimes we might question ourselves, why don't I have faith to trust? Why am I doing this? You might begin to think something is wrong with you. Why am I grieving for someone who is still alive? No, no, no. It is you accepting or beginning to accept the fact that the moment of departure is at hand. It could happen. It might happen. It looks like everything is going to be that way. That the final outcome might be that you will lose this person. You are aware of that. And you are admitting that you don't have the power to stop this process. So you anticipate how you are going, the things you're going to lose when this person is not there any longer. And it causes you to grieve in anticipation. You fear. you terrorized. How can I do all of these taxes myself? How can I do all of this buying myself? How can I clean and make manage this house myself? All of these things that he once did or she once did, how can I cook for myself? You grieve even before you begin to cook for yourself, before you begin to manage your taxes, before you begin to manage your finances. You're already grieving because you are aware of the value of this person in your life. That is hard. So maybe that's where some of us will be because we are expecting, we're still in expectation of the passing of someone. There's also delayed grief. Delayed grief is more likely to happen around and about this time because of the nature of this virus and the way it carries out its sentence on our families and our loved ones. We may be so obsessed with a lot of things and a lot of people dying and a lot of moving parts here and there that we don't even have the time to truly grieve one person we have lost, to say nothing of grief the second or the third. And so we might just shut down, emotionally just shut, experience a shutdown, such that our grief is delayed and may surface down the line. We thought we were doing so well, and suddenly you realize, wow, I thought that was okay. What just happened? Yeah, what is happening is an awareness I didn't really have the time to grieve because there was so much happening at the time. There were so many deaths. There was so much fear. Just did not have the time to ceremonize my loss and to make it make sense to me. That's why it's coming back. It was delayed. It was put forward for the future. So if you experience something like that, there's nothing wrong with it. It is normal. It is natural. It is our way of responding because there were so much, so many juggling parts at the time. You had to keep certain things for the future. You just didn't realize it. Your mind did all of that work for you. It was also a way of helping you cope with the craziness that was around at the time. There is what we call cumulative grief. And that too is something we will experience at this time, it is it is it is it is more likely now than than previously, and cumulative grief will happen when um, I lose my aunt to this virus, and while I'm trying to grieve my aunt, my brother dies, God forbid, or my sister dies, or my friend dies, or my coworker dies. Or someone that I care about dies. And while I'm trying to grieve that one, I hear, I get a, a text message that, you know, something else has happened. So you realize it's almost like one grief is piled on top of another, accumulated. So that's going to happen, you know, a lot. And that is going to immobilize us and sometimes freeze us and make us feel fearful and terrified. Cumulative loss. Is it's something we hear sometimes at war, you know, where a whole you know platoon could just disappear in like one day. Three died now, others died from their injuries, others died from so you realize it's just piling up and there is no time to grieve. Maybe that is what is gonna to happen to you. I don't know, but if it does, 
just recognize that sure that is you trying to make sense of all of the losses piled up one after another there is also prolonged grief prolonged grief is where you know is characterized in some way by extreme and this excessive reaction grief reaction that at that you know uh are prolonged for far longer than it made sense to you you felt like okay maybe in six months one year i'll be okay and then you realize one year is come and gone one year six months two years three years and each time you feel these triggers it feels as if the death or the loss just happened now and you're thinking am i normal is everything okay with me have i do i have a mental problem why, have, why am i still grieving three months three years six months after yeah that's prolonged grief it's possible and it's normal what it's also saying to you is you might need help you might need therapy you might need counseling if it's that prolonged because it's stopping you to function uh, as fully as you can and as fully as you should it's also a, a, a signal it's an alert that this, this is time for us to ask help talk with a, a, a grief counselor or do something join some other grief cafe you know to find some to find some some sanity and some peace in our grief so if that's what you're feeling at this time it may be time for you to seek help and to reach out for help there is secondary grief i i i, I spoke i spoke i said something earlier about about that but secondary grief is where i'm not just grieving the person i have lost I'm grieving the significance, the, the memories, the beautiful things that this person once did for me. All right, their importance in my life, the difference they made in my life, all of those things that would never happen again. Though I, I, I'm grieving all of those things, right? I'm seeing almost like 20 years from now how they will not be there when I'm retired. We cannot travel and go all the places we wanted to go all of the things we had hoped we were going to do so i'm not just grieving that i have lost this individual but with this individual there are so many secondary and third level fourth level fifth level sixth tenth twentieth level effects in this one loss so when if you are experiencing all of that don't think something is wrong and sometimes even when you have new friends you have a new spouse you realize you're still grieving those things you had planned you know for this visit or for these trips or for all of these events that's okay you are recognizing that this person could not be replaced even though there's someone else here as a friend there's another child here who is just been born you are admitting the fact in life that a person is irreplaceable it doesn't matter who else comes in they cannot be replaced and that's okay it is you being honest with life so if that's happening to you embrace it accept it you're normal you're not getting crazy you're not running mad there is also disenfranchised grief and there are people who will experience that there are parents today, there are children today who are um, ostracized either from their families or from their loved ones, un unable to visit, unable to have any relationships. Now that doesn't mean that they don't love them any longer. They still love them. Or maybe they are just not present in their lives. Now, when you feel, when you have lost, when you lose someone like that, and you, can't, you don't have the opportunity to grieve, that is disenfranchised. You are disenfranchised of your right to grieve this person who was who is your mother, even though you didn't have a relationship with her or with him because of everything else. So for us in the military, the cases where because in the military they only allow you to go home when your mom dies, when your dad dies, when your brother dies, when your sister dies, or when your child dies, or your spouse. Now, for some people, they didn't have a dad or a mom, but they did have 
someone who played the role of a mom and a dad, even though he is not officially their dad. So when someone like that dies, and you are not accorded the right to mourn and to grieve them as though they were your dad because they were more, worth more than your dad or your mom in your life. You are disenfranchised of your right to grieve. So there are so many people who will be disenfranchised. Or you may have relationship with people that only you know. And when they pass away, their families don't recognize your right to grieve this person because they didn't know that you were even friends with them. So a lot of those things are going to happen. Those things could happen in your place of work. You meet people and you hear they are dead and you don't have the chance to grieve because no one validates your right to grieve them. You are disenfranchised of your right to grieve. And so maybe that's where you're going to find yourself. You're trying to rationalize this. Well, nobody understands why I'm grieving. Why am I still grieving? No, you're grieving because even though relationships are personal, even though no one knew, or no one cares to know, you know that this person means something to you. And that's okay. Because they did mean something. You're not faking it. Embrace it. It is your loss. You're grieving because it's your loss. It's personal. Grief is very personal. Even though the times where we share losses, grief is personal. It is you who know what you feel and what you're dealing with. There would also be um, something like inhibited grief, where an individual shows no outward sign. You're trying to block your grief, trying to block this sense of pain and sadness that you feel because you're trying to be strong. You're trying to be strong for your children, trying to be strong for somebody, trying to show this toughness, this macho. Now, it does work for some, but the percentage that it works is very little. Because all we're doing is we're just trying to build this wall and rejecting the acceptance of who we are, that we are broken. So maybe we go, we, we, we sneak, go to the bathroom and cry and grieve and scream. No, that's okay. If that's what you're trying to do, trying to fake and make it look okay, it is your way of survival. You're trying to survive under the circumstances. But if it's no longer working for you, you better off admitting it and changing your strategy of grief. People understand. We must not try to be strong when we are not. If we are strong, that's okay. But don't try to be strong when you are not. Don't try to fake it. It's okay to cry. It's okay to grieve. After all, the Lord Jesus himself gave us the right to grieve and to cry. God cried. When Jesus visited Lazarus, scripture said he wept, he cried. He didn't go there and try to be like the macho. He gave us the freedom to allow our emotions show and spring and get life and be recognized and be validated. Jesus did that. So I have the right and the freedom to cry. It's not an act of weakness. To grieve is not weakness. To grieve is human. It is a recognition that I am human and blood and water still flow in my veins. I'll be a robot if I did not grieve, if I did not show pain and sadness over someone I have lost that cannot be replaced. And so I encourage you, accept and embrace all of this, whatever it is that is going on. Don't Cave to it. Don't give it power over you. But recognize that it's happening. It's your reality. Recognize it, but don't give it authority and power over you. You must be on the driver's seat. You must be the one having your grief, not the other way around. Your grief doesn't have to have you. You must have your grief. You must be in control of your grief. Now, I'd I like to go through um, several key facts and fictions about grief. I'll try to run through, through them, you know, very, very quickly. Uh, the first, I, I want to say this. This is a fact that it doesn't matter how much you prepare for the dying of someone. It doesn't matter how much time you had 
to prepare. You will never be fully prepared for the grief. Yes, you can prepare for the death, but not for the grief. So don't mistake the two. You can prepare for the death by getting everything ready, the funeral home, doing every arrangement, preparing all, doing all that you need to do, getting enough money to do. Yes, that's preparing for the death. It's different from preparing for the grief. So sometimes people mistake that. Well, I was so prepared for this death and I can't, I can't imagine why I'm unable to handle the grief. Yeah, because the grief is so different from the death. So you have to recognize that, that preparing for a dying person to die doesn't mean the same thing as preparing for the grief process when this person actually dies. There are two things that are different. You're going to deal with them one after the other. You cannot, it's not like a deposit. I get this deposit and keep and wait. No, it doesn't happen. You can only do it when it happens. So you prepare for the death, but when, when, it, when the death actually happens, you have to now prepare for the grief. Now, they said, um, a hospital death, like someone dying in a hospital, isn't such a bad thing because some of us would wish my mom died at home. Now they're going to die in the hospital with no one out there. I know that death is the loneliest journey that anyone will ever take. It's the loneliest journey. Why? Because death is the experience of the dying person. Yeah, we may try to understand how it feels. No one understands the experience of dying until you're dying. And so death is such a brute fact. It's such a brute experience that only the one who is undergoing it understands it. And it's such a lonely journey because you make that journey alone with your Lord and your Savior. No one. I've never seen two people hold hands. Even when they die from the same source, they can't hold hands and match that journey. Every person walks that walk alone with his Lord and with his Savior. So it's hard. So it doesn't matter whether the person died at home, you were holding their hand, or as in this case, it might make us feel good, make them feel good, but the journey or the death is not better one way or another. It is a journey we would all make and it's lonely. It's only you and your Lord and your Savior. There will be pressure from others for you to move on when someone dies. It's okay now. How long are you going to grieve for this person? Every day you get up and cry. Every day you can no longer... People will make pass judgment sentences on you. Making you feel like you're weak. Making you feel like, feel like something is wrong with you. Making you feel like you are overdoing this. Maybe you are even trying to buy sympathy. That's okay. Shut them down. You know why you are grieving. They don't understand. Because grief, I said, it's personal. Don't begin to question yourself and allow your judgment, you know, be almost reversed in a sense of reverse criticism. You criticize yourself only because you're listening to people who are, may not be helpful to you at the time of your grief. So I encourage you, if you have people piling pressure on you to get better, to get yourself, you know, um, right with your grief. That's time to shut them down and just focus on what is going on with you. They don't understand. Don't focus and get angry or get mad. Just shut down and stay with yourself until you are okay with grieving this person in your own way. Don't grieve in someone's way. You cannot. They may tell you to grieve like this. Don't. Grieve your own way. Just be aware. Just be aware what is going on inside you and when to reach out for help. Death and grief make people uncomfortable. They do. So you're going to see some awkward, you know, uh, reactions from people. People are going to avoid you in some cases. Not because they don't care about your loss. In some cases, they don't even know what to say to you. Grief can make us all very, very uncomfortable. I don't have the words to say I don't know how to um, approach you. I become ver very aware of my own inadequacy. I experience the pangs of inadequacy. I don't feel adequate to be there with you, to provide comfort, to provide. And so what I do sometimes is I avoid you. 
I try not to call because I don't want to hear you cry. So there are people who will avoid, who will be awkward when they come in. They don't even know how to act. That's their recognition that I don't have it together to help you in this situation. So prepare to see and to experience some awkwardness from a lot of people. It's not personal. They do care. They just don't know how to respond to you in your loss because they can't put themselves in your place. So it's okay. Don't take it personally on them. Don't make it about them. Make it about what you are feeling and what you are dealing with. People will bring you food because they do not know what else to do. Don't feel bad. Don't throw it away. Take it. If you don't need it, give it away. You might just want to do charity at that time too. Don't just pile stuff and just allow them waste. If you can't manage, when they bring all of that, accept it. Don't tell them, I don't need that. Then that puts a lot of strain on their kindness. They don't even know how else, what else to do. They're bringing stuff, whatever they're bringing to you. It's because they don't know how to help you. They really want to help you. They want to grieve with you. They want to make it better for you. So they're going to bring all kinds of things to see if they can make you feel better. They want to bring you to a better place. That's okay. Accept them. But you be the manager of your own grief. That's what I will encourage you. Don't, don't, don't pass your pain all right, to someone by rejecting them. They feel rejected when we refuse what they're offering us as their way to support us or their way to help us. People will say very stupid things, sometimes very hurtful things without realizing it. It's a confusion. It's a shock of their loss. They will say, you know, just throw stuff out there in, in so many ways. Yeah, you were not even close with them. They will say some hurtful things without just being aware. Now, when people do that, don't make it about them. As always, focus on what is making you feel the way you feel. Don't, don't be distracted by all the kinds of comments that you hear. When people try to deprive you of your right to feel what you're feeling. Don't focus on that. Focus on what it is that you are feeling. Death brings out the best and the worst in families. Believe it. Death brings out the best and the worst in families. Expect it. Prepare for it. When someone has died, in some cases, that's when families come together. That's when they lay aside all their differences. That's when their best brothers and best sisters, best everything. But there are times where that doesn't happen. Where the passing of a mom or a dad or someone, a husband, a brother, creates this, you know, almost like explodes this nuclear friction in families where the beginning of the end of the family starts right there. If that happens, if, uh, sadly, if that is your fate, you don't be part of the problem. If you cannot be part of the solution as much as possible, just focus on what has caused all of this. Focus on the person that you are grieving. It's personal to you. Don't, let, don't get caught up with everything else that may be playing around. It makes your grief more difficult to manage. So I encourage you. If your family goes into an all for all, all for everyone's fight, don't get involved. Extricate yourself and focus on why all of this is happening. It's because someone has passed. Someone that you all care about. Now there will be regrets no matter how much time you had with this person. It's never going to be enough. You're going to wish you had one more thing, one more time, one more day, one more phone call, one more I love you, one more this. It is just how we feel, we are admitting that this is so very, very bizarre, so weird. Why couldn't I have one more ch chance to kiss my sister, my mom, my daughter, my, my husband, my wife? Why couldn't I have one more minute to even have a phone call or a video chat and just let them know I love them? They do know you love them. They do. They do know you love them. They felt it. The last moment they bred, they took their last breath. They felt it. Your love was the reason they held on to that time. They would go knowing you love them. But if you begin to feel those regrets, just recognize what is happening. 
It's you wishing for more from this person that you care about, that you love, that you wanted in your life. You re, you're trying, you're rebelling that they have left so soon without having the one thing that you thought you could give them forever, which is that one word or that one phrase, I love you. I'm sorry to see you go. They know it. Now, the times where we're going to feel guilty, we're going to feel guilty. Guilty means it's a recognition, all right, that I did not meet my own expectations. Maybe about this person or towards this person. I failed to meet my expectations. But I don't know if that's true, but that's how I feel. So you realize, uh, as human beings, we do have um, our conscious mind. And we also have the subconscious mind. Now, your conscious mind may tell you, what else could I have done? I did everything. But your subconscious will always blame you for something. And you're trying to rationalize and to explain. There's no reason why I should feel like this. But yet, you're feeling like that. That is a battle between your conscious and your subconscious mind. And your subconscious mind does not understand your rationalizations. Yeah, I did everything. You rationalize and explain why you did all and why you should not feel the way you're feeling. Feel guilty. And yet you still feel guilty. That's where PTSD for some people come from. It is that your subconscious is speaking a different language than your conscious mind. And that's not time to struggle to rationalize with your conscious mind because your subconscious mind does not speak English and doesn't understand you. You would have to act as though, don't think as though you did everything right. Begin to act as though you did everything right. Your subconscious mind can relate to how you act and behave, not how you think and how you reason. It's how you act and behave. If you have done everything and can't find a sense of why you're feeling guilty, begin to act like someone who is not guilty. Your subconscious mind can relate to that and stop triggering that sense of guilt in you. Anger could be normal. We just spoke about anger, you know, as a way of coping, so I won't go there anymore. Now, the pain of loss is a reflection of love that but you never regret loving as much as you did. So, if you are grieving someone, that person meant something to you. It is a recognition of how much you love this person and how much that meant to you. Maybe it's time to focus and celebrate the love that you had for this person and the love this person had for you. But never regret loving only because you fear the more I love, the harder my loss would be. No, love and love even more. Even if it's going to be for one day, you will never regret it. So love the person in front of you and love them to death. You will never regret it when they leave. So I encourage you, don't, 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 I'm only going to love this much because I fear in case I lose them so that I don't die. No, you will not die. But love and never hold back. Give it all for the one you care about and the one you love. Grief can make you question your faith. And make you, you know, question, where is God in all this? I prayed, I did all of this. Why is God not here? Why did God not hear me? Why did he take my son? Might make you question. I've seen people who lost loved ones and for so long did not go to church. They didn't pray, they didn't read the Bible. Now that's okay. That's you, angry. You're angry. However, it's important to be aware of why you're doing what you're doing. Don't let it be part of your way of operating. Just be aware that you're angry. That's why you're behaving the way you're behaving. Now, grief doesn't come in five neat stages. I know I said the stages. That's why I said I don't agree with the five stages. So in case you think, okay, I'm going to start with denial. Then I'll go to anger. Then I'll go to bargaining. Then I'll go to um, depression. Then I'll go to acceptance. No, grief doesn't have to come in those five stages. It could come in anywhere. It is scattered. It depends on what is going on, what triggers in your brain. So it's okay if you don't see yourself going through those stages. And instead of going through the first, you're beginning with the last one. That's fine. But you would go through all of those stages. There will be denial. There will be anger. There will be bargaining. There will be depression. There will be acceptance ultimately when it's all over. So if you see all of that, don't, don't, don't get stuck 
with the stages of grief. Grief makes you feel like you're going crazy. I said that many times, but you're not. You are just aware of something that you have lost and you are reacting. We all go into a tantrum when something happens. Whether you are the president or you are the pope or you are a dad, we all we act in some way. We show some, we do some strange behavior when we're angry, when we're mad. Every one of us does that. Either with our facial expressions or the way we throw stuff or the way we behave or the way we act. We all go into a tantrum when something doesn't go right. It doesn't mean we're crazy, but we're crazy for that period that we are angry or we are mad. You may find comfort in very unexpected places. You may find comfort in very unexpected places. Things you didn't, you never cared about. Movies you never watched before suddenly become things that you like. You're thinking, what's wrong with me? I never liked these people. I never liked this. I never liked that. Why am I doing this? Yes, grief can open up new chapters in our life, new experiences, new things we never thought possible, Not at least not for us. And suddenly we're doing all of those things. We're like, why am I doing this? I never came to this place. I never did this. I never. If that's happening to you, that's okay. It's normal. It's natural. It's grief opening up, you know, new recesses of life for you to experience and to see. It's God opening up spaces of comfort for you. If you never went to the park and suddenly you're going to the park and that's okay. Do those things. Just enjoy them. As long as they are not destructive behavior. Enjoy them and do them. The last 24 hours of their lives will replay in your mind for very long. The last 24 hours of their lives will replay. If, for instance, you had the privilege of watching them on their, or maybe a video chat from their hospital room, you know, to you, those last minutes could be very, very devastating. And believe it or not, they are the ones that would last and play in your mind. That video will play in your mind for a long time. Now, it is self-awareness and intentionality that takes you out of that ball game. Because our minds do play tricks on us. They always drift our, mind, our attention to the very ugly, the very bad, the very sensational stuff. But we must have to intentionally shift our focus. Because don't forget that those, those last 24 hours or whatever may be only about 1,000, 1,000 uh, percent. Sorry, it, it maybe one, one out of 1,000 percent of the time we spend with our loved one and the experiences we have. Why can't we focus on all the other 999, you know, uh, percentage experiences that we have? We're just focusing on this one last phase of our loved one's life. Why are we allowing that to happen? Yes, it's because we are not intentional about our grief. We can be intentional on what we focus in our grief. So I encourage you, if that is happening, yes, just be aware why it's happening. And then focus on the beautiful experiences, the wonderful things that this person meant to you. And how they made your life different. And rather than focusing on those that last, that last moment doesn't define their whole life. It only tells you the one difficult moment of weakness. Why are we choosing to focus on weakness, focus on death, and not focus on the life they have with us for the entire time? So I encourage you, do that more. Focus on the beautiful things that also happened in your life with this person that you have lost. Grief triggers are everywhere. They will be everywhere. You will find them everywhere. Suddenly you go to a restaurant and you see yourself grieving instead of enjoying. You go to the park, you see yourself grieving because where. The places you want to spend good time with your loved ones will become triggers. When you gather for something, you hear a song, it just triggers something and you see yourself grieving. That's okay. Those are, are called triggers, grief triggers. They will be there for some time. And when they do, all you must be aware of, it's not weird, it's not crazy, is that they remind you of what you have lost and the value of what you lost. So it's okay. If it's okay, when that happens to you, you see, you experience those sudden burst. The grief process is about not only mourning the loss, but you get to know yourself as different 
from who you were yesterday. We all are going to change in some way. I'm not going to be the friend of somebody because the person died. Yeah, the friendship will stay, the memories will stay, but the physical relationship is no longer there. You're not going to be the husband of somebody, the mother, the daughter, the son of somebody because someone passed. So we are going to know ourselves as different. Our identity, sadly, is going to change and we are going to adapt, slowly adapt to our new reality. It's going to be hard, but sure, that movement is what we need to do. And we begin it slowly by adjusting and by adapting and by moving into that empty space that life has just given to us, life has just put us into. Grief will rewrite your address book, believe it. Grief will rewrite your address book. Because many people you thought would be there for you when you lose someone will not show up. Believe it. They will not show up. And if they do, they will show up in a way, sometimes that might be very offensive and annoying. But you're going to find a lot of other people you didn't even know from anywhere who will show up and be the greatest source of comfort in your life. Embrace them. I know in our lives, we would always grieve what we had and sometimes forget what God is giving to us, what is new that God is giving to us. You remember Samuel. Samuel was grieving Saul. And God had to say to Samuel, Samuel, stop. How long are you going to stay grieving Saul? Forget about that. Get up your picture. Pick up your picture. Go down to the son of Jesse. I have found a new king. God was saying to Samuel, that's okay. I understand you're grieving Saul. But now it's time for us to move to a new direction. So your address book is going to change. You're going to find new friends in your grief. And the old ones are going to drop off and fall off. Because they don't know how to handle what just happened to you. Or in some cases, they don't just want to be part of it. But that's okay. So if it's happening, if it's happened or it's happening to you, it's okay. You will see it. It's the way people react to some other person's pain in cases where they don't know how to do, how to deal with it or just don't want to be there for you. And you don't get over your grief. You don't get over your grief. So if somebody tells you, get over it, they don't know what they're talking about. We get used to our grief. We learn to live with our grief. We learn to live with a hole in our heart. We don't get over it. If you can get over your grief, there wasn't any grief in the first place. That means you really didn't lose anyone. If you have lost someone, you don't get over it. We get used to it. We learn to live with a hole in our heart. We learn to live with our emptiness. We learn to draw strength from this place of loss just to go on, even if it meant for the sake of the people we have lost. So we don't get over it. I encourage you. Watch. Watch. Watch dangerous behavior. Watch alcohol. Watch drugs. Watch anything that may be harmful. Because sometimes grief can force us to begin to look for all these, um, these coping mechanisms that don't work, that only help to destroy us. Think about how many people have been destroyed because they lost someone. That's almost like a double loss. I lose someone, I lose myself in the process. So, watch your behavior around drinks and around drugs. If you see yourself tilting towards those things, that's time to shout for help. That's time to do what Peter did when he, when he cried out to the, to, to, the, to, the, to the Lord. Lord, save me. That's time to reach out for a counselor. That's time to reach out for therapy, to seek help. If you see yourself tilting and using all of these other dangerous um, behavior as coping mechanisms, they are dangerous. Don't do them. I encourage you, please, don't. Now, nothing you do in the future will change your love for the person you died, who died. Nothing you do will change. Because sometimes I hear people, oh, well, I will never marry again because I don't want to marry someone else. Yeah, it's okay if that's what you want. But don't, don't make that as a bargain, as though you, you want to, I want to stay in this place. Yeah, if love comes your way, 
go ahead and enjoy it. I have no doubt your loved one who died will want to see you in love again and happy again. They don't care about you being sad and grieving them for the rest of your life. They want to see you happy. They always wanted to see you happy with them or without them. So your life is going to change. Embrace it. And only embrace it when you can and when it makes sense to you. And when you're able to manage and to handle it. But don't get stuck and thinking, well, I'm going to do this because this is what I promised. Your loved one wants to see you happy. However, if staying alone makes you happy, I'm sure all they care about is to see that you are happy, that you are thriving, that you are okay, that you are handling their passing as well as they would have wished you did. So that's something I want you to think about. Now, there are things you may consider during mourning. I'll just run through them very, very quickly. It says, try to be normal when you feel like being normal. You're not grieving for anyone. If you feel like taking a drink, feel like going down walk, do normal things that you do, just do them. You're not grieving for anyone. You're grieving for yourself. Knowing that grief comes in waves and has its own schedule will also help you. Don't begin to try to grieve in, in bits and pieces uh, based on whatever experts have said. Just go at your own pace, at your own time, and in your own way. Remember to take things one day at a time. Don't think in excess of one day. Three weeks from now, one month from now, where will I be? What will I be doing? Yeah, that is you covering more than you can handle. One day at a time, sweet Jesus. That's all I'm asking from you. It's a beautiful song by by Wanda Jackson and I think um, Christy Lane. One day at a time, sweet Jesus. That's all I'm asking from you. Honor your loved ones by living the way they wanted you to live. For instance, you say, well, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go. I promise I told, I had discussed this with my loved one. I was going to do this. Go ahead and do it. It makes you feel you're, you're meeting an obligation that you had made to your loved one. But always do what also keeps you happy. If what you thought you would keep you happy is not, then there's no need doing it. At all times, seek for what makes bring, brings you genuine happiness. Don't forget, genuine happiness, not pleasure. Genuine happiness. Take comfort. In mourning with others, don't don't just stay alone and grieve. Yeah, if it's possible, join some uh, grief cafe. Talk, share your experiences with others. Don't bottle it up. Don't keep it to yourself. It could get so toxic and so difficult to handle. That's when we begin to go into dangerous behavior because we've allowed, we've blocked the channels for for relationships and opportunities to interact with people who understand what we are dealing with. So I encourage you, don't do that accept the way you feel no matter how you feel accept it just be aware of it this is how i feel and it's okay so accept it don't critique it don't get angry with it don't reject it accept it and embrace it take care of others as a way of taking care of yourself yeah still focus on your children focus on people that you still care about because though we've lost this one person there's so many other people around that we care about Still spend time and care for them. That's one way of also helping to care for yourself. If it's possible and you choose to wear the things they gave you, the ring, the, 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 um, the rich watch, the clothes, whatever, even if they are own clothes that you want to wear to keep you part of, you may want to do that as long as it helps you stay in contact with the person that you have lost. Now, talk to them, even if it's just one side, one-sided. All right. Let them know how their, their, their passing has affected you, how your life has changed. You might just sit down and just talk or write how all of this is affecting you day by day. It also helps you to process your grief and come to a place of respite and peace. If it gets too bad, seek a therapist. And finally, make time, maybe 15 minutes in a day, 30 minutes in a day to just grieve until you are okay. So I encourage you, do all of that. It will help us, it will help you handle what is going on. My final thought, it's about negativity bias. I'm sure you something you've heard about. Negativity bias, you know, it's, um, it's a tendency that allows us in most cases to, re to register, for our minds to register negative stimuli more readily than we will register it may be a positive event or something that was good. All right. For whatever reason, our minds are just so hardwired to do that. And I said something about us 
focusing so much on the last 24 hours. I beg you, when you are grieving your loved ones in your grief, don't focus just on the few ugly things that happened in your life. Maybe the last moment of dying. That's what your mind will want you to do. It's called negativity bias. It it's, let's, let's us remember experiences that are worse than those that are positive. It makes us recall insults more than we, we, that we remember praises. It makes us regard strongly to negative, so negative stimuli get, uh, get our attention more than positive ones. You know, we think about negative things more frequently than positive things. You, you watch our news media. You see some of the good things. They're trying now, maybe trying to focus on some good things that people are doing around. But you think about all that they show us is just to terrorize and traumatize us. Our brains do the same thing too with us. So we've got to be aware of that and choose intentionality it's a principle of human survival and thriving where you intentionally do things not just reactively reactively you realize everything can get your attention you choose where you focus your attention that's intentionality so i encourage you in whatever we do through these next several days let us focus every one of us is going to lose someone that we know distant or close but we must survive it together and as always, I like to end you know, my discussions and my reflections by reminding you that God loves you very much. And I do love you and I pray for you and I carry your pain in my heart because my own heart is also broken by the losses I have so far experienced, whether those of my patients or people that I know, parishioners, people who have made my life what I am today. We are all in this together and together we will survive it. I'm just going to end with a prayer for every one of you out there. Most gracious God, you have allowed us to experience this moment of grief at a time that is so fitting, so soothing, when your own son went through the cross, the pain and passion of the cross. As we go through and relieve these experiences of human pain and misery and sadness and grief, we ask, O oh God, that your grace may be with us, that your blessing may shine on us, and that your peace may breathe calm in our hearts as we grieve the passing of our loved ones. Heal every broken heart, O oh God, and give rest to every one we have lost. This we ask out of your mercy and your favor through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you.